These professional chefs all want to break into the top ranks of the world's culinary elite. Deciding who has the talent to cut it is MasterChef judge Greg Wallace. That is it, mate. That is right on the money. And culinary legend Michelle Rue Jr. With two Michelin stars, he's expecting perfection. I think it's a very good dish. Cooking doesn't get better than this. Ludovic, Hannah, Matt and Daniel have made it through to the quarter-final. To get to the quarter-final, they've had to cook good food. But now they're going to have to turn it up and get even better. This quarter-final is a totally different ball game. I've got to pull all the stops out if I want to do well and uh, push through to the next round. I think I got through the heat because they saw potential in me. Hopefully today I can prove that I am a good chef. Now that I'm here in the quarterfinals, it really does mean a lot to get to the semi-finals. It's definitely what I'm aiming for now. I won't be happy with anything less than getting through today. I think today the pressure already started and I feed on it. I think I can win the competition. I've got that little thing in me saying that I can make it. Today they face only one daunting challenge. We know these four chefs can cook, but which one of them can go all the way to Michelin star status? You're not just cooking for us today, you are cooking for restaurant critics. You need to cook your hearts out. You need to give us your passion and soul on the plates today. At the end of this, the best two will go through. The other two will be leaving us. Make yourselves proud, off you go. In exactly an hour and a half, the chefs will have to serve a three-course menu that represents the very best of their cooking. It couldn't get more pressurised than this situation. They're fighting for their place in the competition and they are cooking for their own reputation. If they have a dream to become a great chef in the future, it's deliver today. Cooking for food critics, uh, Michelle and Greg again, is going to be absolutely nerve-wracking and exciting. I can't wait to go in there and get my skills out and produce real clean plates. Daniel is the most experienced of our chefs today. He's been in the kitchens now for 18 years. There are touches of original brilliance about Daniel. He really did impress me with that carpaccio of venison with the cranberry vinaigrette. I have never come across using cranberries as a dressing. Yeah, yum. Perfect matching. <sighs> I thought that was a revelation. So much so that I think I may even work on it and present something like that in my restaurant. However, he can get it terribly wrong. The chocolate sauce is almost a chocolate sauce that you could have as a dessert. When it hits chocolate, whoa, you're into marshmallow land. It's not a pleasant place for the venison to be. Complete consistency of excellence throughout. That and that alone will get him into the next round. I'm really excited with my menu choice. I think everyone's going to be pushing the boat out, so I think, yeah, it's going to be very hard today. You have some lovely, lovely ingredients here. I hope you're going to do them justice. What are you cooking? I'm going to start off with a puff pastry asparagus tartlet with some hand-picked noodling crab, rolled in a little bit of creme fraiche and some chervil, and then roast rump of lamb with its own kidneys and sweetbreads, fondant potato, broad bean fricassee, and just the lamb jus. Then to follow, I'm going to do a chocolate coulon with muscovado and coffee ice cream. Simple and straight to the point. A warm chocolate pudding with a runny centre. Yes. The last time you gave us chocolate wasn't hugely successful. No, no, not at all. But hopefully I've kept the flavours nice and clear, so it's all about the chocolate and just the ice cream this time. It is an exciting menu. Are you absolutely sure about these timings? So hopefully it'll be OK. I've just got to get around to doing the fondant potatoes in a minute, otherwise I'll be in, be in trouble. I'm excited by Daniel's menu, most certainly. I'm also nervous. Daniel's starter sounds really exciting. I'm not so sure the food critics are going to really get their head around this avocado sorbet. If it's judged properly, if it's not too sweet, got the right amount of lemon in, it will work. 
Frenchman Ludovic has made Wales his second home since moving there 11 years ago. I'm a Breton from France and I'm cooking for Wales because it's a great nation who need to be represented and I just love it. Ludovic is definitely one of our most creative chefs. Ludo putting the smoked eel on crew, the smoked eel in the pastry was just amazing. It's not a flavour combination I've ever tasted before, I've ever seen before. It works. It's nice, it's, it's very nice. He even admitted that he'd never even seen it himself before, that it was a one-off thing that just came to him. There were little mistakes in his classic recipe test. The pastry's not quite cooked enough. It's a little bit soft underneath, which it shouldn't be. It should still be crunchy. What I'm looking for is a firmer, almost flaky pastry. And what I've got is a bendy pastry, and it just doesn't feel right. The guy can cook, and he's got great imagination. He can't afford any mistakes today, not on quarter-final day. And if he is going to be as creative, he's going to have to really watch him, really work hard. Uh, you seem very confident. You were humming away to yourself earlier. And, yeah. Um, really in control. Is that so? Yes, it is. What are your dishes, Ludo? Uh, to start with, I've got Puy Fuissé oyster jelly with cucumber spaghetti, horseradish cream and caviar. <laughs> and a bit indulgent, putting good white burgundy in your jelly? Yeah, we'll have a class when we taste the dish. <laughs> right, main course? Welsh lamb wrapped in bayon ham with uh, wilted spinach, Provencal vegetable and uh, fondant kohlrabi. And I do a lamb and saffron jus to go with it. Puddings, we're having a pear and rot for souffle. Puddings are supposed to be sweet. How can it be sweet with salty blue cheese in it? Uh, in Brittany, we mix uh, rot for with anything. Th this is slightly experimental. Are, are, are you concerned about that? No, not at all. Why? The final product is nice. I can't say more. Ludo is hugely experimental, yes. Oysters with white wine, parsley, shots, I get it. In a jelly? No, I've never eaten that before in my life. Roasted lamb with Provencal vegetables? Yeah, OK. With a saffron sauce? Never. Then we've got pear and roquefort, tried and tested combination? Yes, of course. In a souffle for dessert? Never. Let's hope he just delivers the goods now. I feel confident to cook for uh, food critics, especially at this stage of the competition. What I'm doing is pretty straightforward, but it is tasty and the food speaks for itself. I believe in my food. Obviously, I would love to get through to the next round. I am a really competitive person. There's no point entering a competition if you don't want to win. Anna is our least experienced chef in the quarterfinals, but she has fire in her belly. She really wants this. She certainly has the flair, the ambition, and the understanding of what makes great food. It is as pretty as a picture. It's that plate of food that you just, as a diner, want to dive in. For me, one of the outstanding dishes throughout the competition was Hannah's Brittany cake. Let me tell you, that is really good. By far the best cake on the bench, by far. The presentation is quirky, yet fun, and quite appetising, I think it's great. Well done. That girl has raw talent at the moment. It needs to be shaped, it needs to be given direction. That, unfortunately, did show on the odd little occasion. Oh, dear, Hannah. Something's gone wrong here, I think. The tuna's slightly overcooked. Can the exuberance of youth and that passion that she has, that natural flair, really push her to the summit of her cooking? My menu today is asparagus tortellini with poached quail eggs and hollandaise. And then I've got a stir-fried duck with sweet and sour sauce and a peach panna cotta with pink champagne ice cream. If anything's going to go wrong, what's it going to be? I'm really worried that my panna cottas aren't going to set in time, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, are they in the fridge? They are, yeah. How much do you really want this, Hannah? I really, really do want this. My mind's like a sponge. All I want to do is suck up the information and just keep learning. I think I've got potential and just hope that you and the food critics see it today. Good luck, Hannah. Thank you. Good luck. I think Hannah has two complex, delightful dishes and one that is questionable. Stir-fry? Does stir-fry sound fine dining to you? That's going to have to be one hell of a stir-fry to get to the level that we expect. I just wonder if she's going to be able to get the food out on time. Twenty-six-year-old Matt became a head chef four years ago and has already earned two rosettes. 
I think the restaurant creates a light my food, the simplicity of it, the good flavours. Honest food is what it's all about, so hopefully they'll be impressed. The skill and the presentation standards made us stand back and think, my word, we have a real talent on our hands. Fantastic colours. Very artistic. You've given it height as well. On well, both these dishes, I love your presentation. The sauces are lovely. You are a talented boy. He understands great flavours in his sauces. Fantastic presentation. He's got to eliminate those little errors, though. The rice isn't cooked properly. It's too hard. Uh, it should be more creamy and unctuous. Being a chef is all about pressure, and I don't think I'll have any problems with handling the pressure today, even though it's a, a level up from what I'm used to. Right, Matt, what are you cooking for us? My starter is a risotto of crab and chilli with poached quail's eggs and crispy bacon. And my main course is a loin of venison with a sweet potato and red onion rosti. And for pud? For pudding, I'm doing a lemon panna cotta with chilled raspberry soup and a ginger twill. Mmm. Mm. Which one are you most proud of? Um, to be honest, after the last round, I'd quite like to see my sweet do well. I find it harder to be a bit more creative with sweets. Have you cooked for food critics before? I have cooked for food critics before a few times, and it's, um, it's a different experience. It's nerve-wracking. For me, it's like cooking for family, because you know you're going to get the feedback, whether it's good or bad, you know? You can imagine me cooking for my family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the same. Matt's got a nice menu on paper, but it's the execution of it. That's what's important. He didn't do his rice pudding very well last time. He's got uh, rice in the risotto today. Let's hope he cooks it. His main course of venison and sweet potato rosti. Again, that's lovely flavours. Really good combination. We haven't seen a good dessert from him yet. Lemon panna cotta with a raspberry soup and a ginger twill sounds delicious. It's 20 minutes before service and the critics arrive. John Walsh writes for The Independent. What you're looking for as a diner is evidence of cooking that's more than just combining things. You need a wallop of flavour that's slightly unexpected and intensely satisfying. Andy Haler is a food writer who's dined at three Michelin-starred restaurants around the world. Even amongst their professional kitchens, it's amazing how often you get basic errors. It's certainly a, a rare treat to get something that's really memorable. Jay Rayner is restaurant critic for The Observer. A three-course menu should be balanced. It should have a beginning, a middle and an end. It should be a story. Restaurant critics, if you cook well for them, they really can make or break your reputation. How's the sorbet doing? Sorbet's fine, it's out and in the fridge. That's all done, you happy with it? Yes, I am. Good. First to face the critics is Daniel. In principle, each bit of Daniel's menu makes a lot of sense. I'm slightly concerned there might be one ingredient too many. I just wonder if a sorbet is quite what you want with a first course. You've got ten minutes left, chef. That first course has got to go out. Take care on presentation, Daniel. Take care. Get it right. You've got three minutes. Nearly there. Final touches, Daniel? Yep. Excellent, well done. Let's go, well done, on time, let's go. Well done, Daniel. Thirty-two-year-old Daniel has made an asparagus and crab tartlet with avocado sorbet. The crab taken alone is pretty nice. Yeah. The sorbet. I don't mind, but you try to put it all together um, and it doesn't work. I hate to say it, but I think the avocado is too sweet. I'm rather tempted to kind of push the sorbet to one side and enjoy the rest because the crab is really, really rather well done. I just think this is a very good example of, of a chef sort of trying too hard to show off his technique mm. and, and not really thinking about what it's going to taste like at the end of the day. That avocado sorbet is a step too far, and I find it far too sweet. This reminds me of the chocolate sauce with the venison. I don't mind creativity. I'll applaud creativity, but this is going too far. Daniel, eight minutes and your main course has got to go out, yeah? How are you doing for timing? Just OK? A bit pushed, but we'll get that.
Two minutes, Daniel. Are you going to be serving those pom fondants? I don't think I will. They're too underdone. You better explain that to the critics. It's on the menu, so you better tell them why you're not serving them. Okay. That's time. Come on. Come on, get them out. That's time. Go, 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 go. Don't drop it. Hold on. Yeah, they're, they're not cooked. I can't. Hi, guys. I, my fondants weren't done in time. I wouldn't serve them in my restaurant, so I wasn't going to serve them to you. Daniel still hopes to impress with his rump of salt marsh lamb served with sweetbreads and kidneys, broad bean fricassee and a lamb jus. I think it looks quite a, a nice plate of food, a nice rich coloured sauce. A potato fondant would have been a wonderful thing on there, that's a shame. My lamb is clearly overcooked and I'm a little bit concerned about these broad beans and if I'm not mistaken, he's forgotten to take the skin off. It's kind of cooking 101, you shell broad beans. When you actually can't really cut into the, the kidney mm. without some kind of implement from Black & Decker, then you know that probably the chef's cooked it a bit long. It looks to be the same, probably, <coughs> with the sweet bread, which is horrendously overcooked. The jus seems very nice. If only the fondant potatoes were here, because we do need some kind of mm. root vegetable to soak it up. To get four or five or six different components all ready at the same time, all in optimum condition, is actually quite hard, and you've got to be quite talented to do that. But unfortunately, he hasn't really executed any of them apart from the sauce. I'm a bit glum, really. A nice lamb has been slaughtered for no good cause. <laughs> I like lamb. Poor lamb. Now Daniel must produce a fault-free chocolate fondant. You've checked your ice cream? Yes, it's fine. Good. Three minutes. We're doing OK? Yeah. Are they going to be cooked in three minutes? I hope so. Fingers crossed. Running around like a madman and I ain't got time for a pint. Two minutes. Looks a bit wobbly. Ooh. That looks a treat. Daniel's dessert is a chocolate coulon served with muscovado and coffee ice cream. The only way you'll get away with presentation this simple is if it's perfect. For once, the chef has really pared everything down to what the dish should be about. You don't need a whole pile of complicated garnishes to make the dish attractive. Mm. The two flavours are light, balanced and very, very Moorish. It just slathers you in chocolate kisses. I've got a problem with this, which is I'm at the beginning, really, of quite a long meal. <laughs> and I really want to finish this. No, you can't. Oh, God, can I? I think it's the best pudding I've had in months, I think. There's no way you can imagine that the man who made all the technical errors on his main course and overcomplicated his starter should come up with something as simple and as brilliant and as poised as this. That was mental. Absolutely mental. That's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I've never sweated and perspired so much. You've got five minutes to go before the first course. So it seems to me a very ambitious menu. There's a lot of technique required there. There's this is high wire trickery that's going on here, and I have no idea what to expect. Is the jelly set, Ludwig? Yes. You have two and a half minutes. 30 seconds, please, Ludo. Come on, Ludo, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You're there, come on, well done. Well done. Bonjour. Ludwig's starter is oyster and white burgundy jelly with cucumber spaghetti, horseradish cream and caviar. It's very neat, very neat and precise. 
I hope it tastes all right. I am concerned about an oyster jelly, I've got to be honest. What it will all come down to is the seasoning and the set of that jelly. If that doesn't work, the rest of it is valueless. I think there's a, a vibrance here and a lightness of touch, which is amazing. There's some really, really clever stuff going on here. The jelly is very, very good. The, the seasoning is very, is very accurate. Mm. I think he's gone to a great deal of hard work and pulled off this high wire act very skillfully. Wow, that's quite amazing, actually. That is quite amazing. It's good. In fact, I think it's very good. Ludo, you've got four minutes. Thank you. You have four minutes, old son. Should we, should we move? I'm nervous. How long are you going to be? I'm going to be one minute. If you are going to be late, you should go and tell them, yeah? If it's necessary, it will be one minute. I'm plating now and I'm coming to you straight away. Keep it together, Ludo. Come on. You're nearly there. Yeah? You're three minutes over, Ludo. Yeah, I'm going now. Despite being late, Ludwig hopes to impress with his pan-roasted cannon of Welsh lamb wrapped in Bayonne ham, Provençal vegetables, baby spinach and saffron jus. The lamb is, is lovely, it's correctly cooked, it's got very good taste. There's a lot of skill in the vegetable cookery. It's just a shame the kohlrabi is undercooked. It's not fantastic sophisticated, but it's it's extraordinarily well done. There's no fireworks here. There's no boom and flare that we saw in the starter, but there is some very good, solid, craftsman-like cooking. It's got a lot of flavour, bags and bags of flavour. But it's lacking finesse. Already behind, Ludwig's timings on his pear and roquefort souffle must be spot on. You've got four minutes left, Ludo. How long does these take to cook? They take eight minutes, Chef. So it means you're going to be four minutes late? Yes. The train is falling apart. <laughs> the wheels are coming off the wagon. Yeah, that's the shame. Yes. Well, hang on in there. Come on. You're in the last home straight. I think they're going to come out, but I'm not happy with the mix. You're nearly there. They're looking good. Don't worry. You don't need the bicycle pump. They've risen. No, I don't. Thank you, Chef. Well done, Ludo. OK, go for it. Well done. I'm not pleased with myself. I'm sorry for the delay. Almost ten minutes late, Ludwig finally serves his pear and roquefort souffle. Mm. I'm willing to say that I can imagine there are a bunch of people who wouldn't like this. Yep. But I think it's fantastic. This is the third very, very good dish from Ludwig, and uh, I think you have a very, very talented chef. A miracle. What is? Who is this guy? I love the combination of pear and roquefort, but it is neither a cheese course or a dessert. I'm not sure whether that's dessert, but it is madly inventive and it tastes divine. He's a clever boy. That's lovely. I started on very, very well. I knew what I was doing. Then after, I was a bit stressed for my main course. A bit of my heart was missing. Stress filled that bit of my heart. Next up is 21-year-old junior sous chef Hannah. Just 10 minutes left. Yeah, OK. What have you got left to do, Hannah? Eight. 
some hollandaise and fry off my red chard. Okay, that's going underneath the, uh, the underneath pasta. Underneath the pasta, yeah, it is. Come on, Hannah, focus. Remember who you're cooking for. Done. Can we go? Yeah. Hannah's starter is an asparagus mousse tortellini served with poached quail's eggs, hollandaise sauce and a truffle foam. She's made a lovely foam there. I would have liked a bit more of that because there's not enough moisture in there for me, just visually. She makes her own pasta rather well, actually. Oh. It's just what's inside it is disappointing. The flavours are not very bold, so the, um, the asparagus is quite sort of muted and a bit of seasoning would, would help. It's not bad, it's just not very exciting. There is some technical skill here on the plate, but that's not enough. You've got to feed me, you've got to excite me, you've, you've got to thrill me. Hannah, just ten minutes left. You've got four and a half minutes, Hannah, are you going to do it? Yes, I am. Sixty seconds. Time's up. Duck not cooked. No. Try the other ones. Otherwise, back in the oven. You're going to have to go out there and tell them. Gentlemen, I'm ever so sorry, but I'm going to be a few minutes late. My duck's just not quite there, OK? okay. Thank you. Well, we're there now, Hannah. We have to go, huh? Come on. Yeah. That's it. Now, go. You are six minutes over, Hannah. Oh, my God. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. Keep it together. Keep going, keep going. Quick, 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 quick. Anything else to go on there? No. no. OK. Hannah now needs to show that her duck on stir-fried vegetables with sweet and sour sauce was worth the wait. The presentation isn't very appealing. The sauce looks like someone's taken some tomato puree out of a tube and put it on the plate. I think the little julienne vegetables aren't bad in a sesame-infused way. That sauce has completely lived down to my expectations. It's just such an ill-conceived dish. Are there any redeeming features, I ask myself? Let me think. No. No. This has possibly shown her inexperience in cooking and maybe lack of confidence. It's not accomplished. Not what we're after. She's got pudding to try and save the game. Four minutes, Hannah. This is your chance to really shine. And as peach panna cotta, I'd love panna cotta. Whether you need a champagne sorbet, pink or otherwise, with it, I would very much uh, dispute. One of them's leaked. It has set, though. It has set. Good. You're giving me kittens, you know that. Presentation, yeah, remember? Keep it nice and neat. Looking really nice. Well done. Oh! Well done. For dessert, Hannah has made peach panna cotta topped with a pink champagne sorbet and strawberry puree. I like that. I think it's very nice. It looks accomplished. It's very neat, very tidy. I think she could be a pastry chef. That is beautiful. That is so light and bursting full of fire. That is it, mate. That is right on the money. Now, Hannah must wow the critics. It's pretty in a rather sort of um, sweetie coloured primary school classroom sort of way. It's not an unattractive presentation. Um, 
but let's see how it tastes. Well, it's a panna cotta itself, I think it's got very nice texture and um, it's actually quite, quite well made. There is technique here. As we saw in her starter, we've got a, a good champagne sorbet, we've got a, a good panna cotta, which isn't easy, but just generally, it's a very limp plateful. That has been the most stressful one and a half hours ever. It's just like one massive race and it's a race to the finish line and unfortunately I finished late because of my main course but the buzz is just amazing. Last to serve is Matt. You have six minutes, Matt. You're going to do it. Six minutes, this start's got to go out. There's a lot of things in here that I like. It's written with a certain confidence, which gives me a certain confidence. It's a coherent menu, um, and um, should you know, look, look forward to trying it. You all right with that risotto? Yeah, thanks. You've got a minute. Good life. Hold well on. Matt's starter is risotto of crab and chili with poached quail's eggs and crispy bacon. The rice is somewhat underdone. It's not appalling. I mean, actually, it's quite, you know, toothsome. I could quite happily shovel up the whole lot and I like crisp bacon like this. I think it's, it's lovely. The problem is that it overwhelms mm. everything else. You eat a piece of this, you're not going to taste any of the risotto for the next five minutes. But I like the fact that the crab is lurking in there among all these little, or among all the bits of rice. You either just have the risotto and stick some egg and bacon on top or you have a, generally just a, a crab and chilli risotto and that will be fine. To me, they're not inherently that compatible. the bacon and egg on that crab is a mistake. It doesn't look right. That should have been simply a crab risotto with a bit of chopped parsley on the top. I'm not really bowled over by it. It says it's with chilli, but there's no real bite to it. Matt, you've got four minutes. Just needs a little bit more resting, but yeah, it's fine. You've got a minute. Come on, Matt, you're nearly there. Last few drops of sauce, let's go, come on. Matt has made loin of venison on a sweet potato and red onion rosti with parsnip puree and glazed turnip. So I think it's a very attractive plate of food, actually. It looks very nice to me, not too complicated. Lots of really big flavours in here. The venison's cooked very well, the sauce is good and deep, and um, I very much like this parsnip puree. It's silky, it's well seasoned. It's a nice dish. This rusty is too much of a cake, I think. Since they're being slightly too thick, slightly too moist. But this is lovely. This parsnip done to the max. Yeah, it's a very hearty dish. Uh, it's got tremendous sort of depth of flavour. Overall, I, I really like the dish. There is a, a culinary literacy at work here. The sweet potato rushti apart, I think it's a very good dish. The winner there is that sauce. It is deep and it's rich. You have three minutes, Matt. Steady hand. Concentrate. Careful. Let's go. Well done, Matt. Matt's dessert is a lemon panna cotta served with a chilled raspberry soup and ginger tweel. This charming little um, paisley tick of uh, two tweel biscuits is uh, very charming. Yeah, go for it. I'll jump in straight away. Uh, I actually think the tweel is quite nice. It's very nice texture. There's a little hint of ginger. The raspberry sauce is just a little sharper than you would like. 
it's not unappealing. I'm quite enjoying eating it, but it, it doesn't show a shimmering brilliance in the kitchen. It was a good pudding. I think I'll be a bit hard on it. I think it was, wasn't mediocre, it was good. That is a beautiful, rich raspberry colour. So we've got a lemon panna cotta, which is creamy but tart, very tart, and a coolie, which is tart. It's lacking balance. It's inches away from being a stunningly good dessert. It just needs a little bit more sugar. The first thing now is, is totally different to working in a normal kitchen. You make silly mistakes, you do things that you would never normally do day after day, and after you sell, afterwards you just kick yourself thinking, why did I do that? You know? Thanks, great of you to join us. We need help uh, judging this. What did you think generally of our four quarterfinals? The standard really was quite impressive from some pretty young cooks, but there are still ups and there are still downs. The most frustrating one, I think, for me was Daniel, where we had just a real horror show of a main course. And then I think we were all absolutely stunned when this great dessert arrived. I thought Ludovic Dumagard is a magician with food. Pierre Roquefort souffle, I've never tried it before. It was stunning. With Hannah, we see someone who can actually cook in technical terms quite reasonably. You can cook pasta well and you can poach an egg well, but if it actually doesn't taste very nice at the end, then you haven't executed it well, I'm afraid. For Matt, there were no glaring errors. A very, very nice main course and a, and a competent dessert. Once again, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming here and helping us out. Your words of wisdom have really helped us. Thank you very much. The guys here today have really performed well and delivered the goods. They can all leave here with their head held high. The restaurant critics themselves said, yes, this was a very high standard, and it was. I do believe we have uncovered a real superstar. I mean, we talk about talent and flair and style, and there's one guy here who's just got it in absolute abundance. That is Ludo. However, there is a big issue with Ludovic, and that is his timing. His souffle was nearly 10 minutes late. That's not acceptable. I'm going to forgive him because that food was simply outstanding. He put combinations together I hadn't seen before. He put combinations together that actually worried me. Nothing worried me more than an oyster jelly flavoured with white burgundy. But actually, it was just stunning. His roasted lamb wrapped in bayon ham was a little bit messy on the plate because he was running out of time, but it was nonetheless flavoursome. Each and every mouthful of that souffle had the right amount of rock for and pear. There's no way that was a dessert, but it was simply outstanding. He at times looks a little bit too at ease and maybe, dare I say, laid back, but he's good. He's very good. It's up to him. If he wants to go all the way, I think he can. My chance is 50-50. Probably I was overconfident and didn't see the time flying by because I was having fun. I was in a kitchen doing what I love. I want to talk about Daniel. His starter he had really well-flavoured crab atop his asparagus. And then for reasons best known unto himself, he gave us a really sweet avocado sorbet. For me, it killed that dish. His lamb was overcooked as was his sweet bread and his kidney. The pom fondants, thankfully, he didn't serve them because they were raw. He somewhat redeemed himself with the pudding. The critics absolutely loved it. The ice cream was very smooth and the chocolate cake was runny, cooked just right. What you're hoping is if you put Daniel through, he would show more flair in the next round. I hope I have wowed the judges for my dishes. I wasn't trying to go wild or crazy or creative today. I was just trying to keep it just nice and neat and be a bit diverse in my menu. I think Hannah did well, but in parts. I enjoyed her starter. It showed a lot of skill, but lacked in depth of flavour. I don't care what the critics say. That peach panna cotta with the champagne sorbet was a real high point. I think the girl may have a talent for, uh, for pastry. That Hannah was concentrating and taking so much time on her starter and dessert that she went for the easy, quick option with a duck stir-fry, simply no way near the level that we were looking for. She's got the raw talent, but it's tough for her. She is the youngest, she is the least experienced. Obviously, I'm a lot younger and I've got less experience than the other guys, but I do think I held my own in there and I'm happy with what I've done today. 
Matt's risotto was slightly undercooked for me. But despite that, it uh, wasn't a bad texture, but the flavours were, were, were amiss. It wasn't bursting with sweet crab like it should have been. His main course of venison was very well cooked, I thought. It had a really smooth, sweet, past it puree and a heavenly sauce. I mean, that boy can do sauces. And he had fantastic presentation in his dessert. Desserts aren't just supposed to look great. They're also supposed to be sweet, and for me, this one had no balance. It wasn't sweet enough. But that ginger twill biscuit was great. We knew he could deliver great sauces, and he did so today. We knew he was good at presentation, and yet again, he delivered today. The MasterChef competition as a whole has been great for my confidence, and to get to the semi-finals would just put me even further on the trail to, to believing in myself a bit more. We're looking for someone who could be a real future star. Who's got it in them? Who do you trust? I know who I want. We can only take two of you through to the next round. Two of you have to leave us. Our first chef going through to the next round is... Ludovic. Our second semi-finalist is... Matt. I'm a little bit disappointed. If anything, this experience has spurred me on even more. My passion has definitely grown for cooking. There's plenty more left in me. I would have liked to go through to the semis. It would have been nice to uh, push to that next level, but it wasn't to be. I'm sure I'll come up against other things that are going to be just as hard, but that was one of the hardest things I've done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when my name got called, really, it was a surprise. I am extremely happy. I am ecstatic. I'm one step closer. I just want to win it. <laughs> my stomach was all in knots, uh, butterflies, my heart was pounding. And then when he said my name, it was just a, a massive relief. I'm absolutely delighted to have got through to the semis. Today wasn't my best effort, and I know I need to produce my best in the next round. It's do or die time then. It's definitely a name now to, to go all the way. Hey, well done. Oh, fantastic. Matt and Ludwig will be back for the semi-finals when they'll battle it out for the title of professional MasterChef.